One year in to owning this Quad 3090 rig, I like to do reviews and bring people up to speed with things I think were good about the decision and things I think could be improved. As well, we'll talk about some budgetary items that I think if you were looking for doing something kind of along these lines at a little bit different of a price point, you might wanna consider. Let's dive in. So the Quad 3090 rig has performed amazingly well for me with 96 gigabytes of total VRAM to be shared among four 24 gigabyte GPUs. This is based on an AMD Epic platform, which is a wonderful platform for doing this. So let's break this down component by component in the rig. So first off, I think the actual frame itself, this is a GPU mining frame from way back when. These are old school designs. These are still excellent for quad to six GPU rigs. It does depend on the size of the GPU you're gonna put in it. So do keep in mind if you wanted to put something like the largest, fattest cards out there into this, you might have some adjustments that you're gonna make. However, mine is severely limited because I made some changes to the way that I'm able to hold the radiator up here. So that limits the back clearance. If you didn't have that alteration, you would be able to fit quite a bit more. One of the ways that you could do that is by not having the water pump be a component. And you don't have to at all have the water pump be a component in this. You could easily use something like a Peerless Assassin 120 SE if you are going with some alternative designs, which I think are really common sense once we start talking about the next probably most important component. So yes, I definitely still highly recommend the mining rig frame. Excellent choice, really good. And if you've got four GPUs that are large size, like 3090s, or up to six GPUs that are a smaller size, like a 5060 Ti, or pretty much anything underneath a you know mega size card, you're gonna be able to fit that into one rig very easily. Next, probably most important component though, is talking about the motherboard. And especially when we're talking about the motherboard, there's a lot of reasons that I chose this specifically. And having all the RAM available that I would be able to do inference at the time I knew was gonna be something that I was gonna wanna do, it allowed me to be able to do things like run DeepSeek R1, which came in at a Q4 within that memory footprint. The 512 gigabytes of RAM is a tremendous amount of RAM, however. Do you need that much RAM is a good question. If you're not interested in doing CPU inference, there's probably a better way to go that can save you quite a bit of money. This is a B650 Eagle, and this is a really cheap motherboard, and it is a gigabyte one. It has four PCIe slots. Yes, four PCIe slots. Now, it's not the most whiz-bang B650 board out there, not, not by any stretch of the imagination but with four full-size slots, it gives you the capability to have four risers. One of the important concepts is that unless you're training, unless you're fine-tuning, unless you're image generating, unless you're video generating, you are not going to use the maximum bandwidth of your GPUs. So that is something I've hit kind of hard on, but let me hit hard on it again. It will split your GPUs across four, if you have four. If you have two, it'll split it across two. Power consumption will get reduced as well as the performance will be capped at that of one single GPU. So for instance, if you put in a 4090 and a 5060 Ti, your performance is gonna be capped at that of the 5060 Ti because it goes to the lowest common denominator, which because if you think about it in this sense, makes a lot of sense. When you spread the model across all the GPUs, the slowest one is going to be what determines your token speed based upon how it's sharded across them. That also is why you don't see 100% utilization of your GPUs. So when you're looking at motherboards, the B650 Eagle is a great choice for the reason that also, instead of needing to get expensive risers, these Okino's risers are great. They are very expensive and you don't have to get them if you're gonna be essentially running at a 1X on PCIe 3. Is it okay to run 1X at PCIe 3? If you are just focused on inference, yes, it absolutely is. So for inference, your PCIe speed does not matter. Your PCI generation does not matter. I've covered this a lot. I've said this a lot, and this is the most frequently asked question. So one more time, your PCIe generation speed for inference does not matter in a multi-GPU setup. It doesn't matter in a single GPU setup really either. It is going to already be at the maximum and you are loading the model 
completely into VRAM. So if you are offloading it and you are loading it onto, say, shared system memory, you can see some minor impacts there as you get down to a single width lane on something like Gen 3. But again, those are gonna be pretty minor impacts that you're gonna see. The best CPU out there for that motherboard right now is the Ryzen 5 9600X. This is a great, affordable, very affordable, with a really good high single core thread speed. Why do I say really good high single core thread speed is important? We proved this out a long time ago. The difference between capping out at 3.625 gigahertz and capping out at 5.4 gigahertz is roughly six to seven tokens per second difference. So that is actually substantially faster to go this route. Could I drop this motherboard and that CPU and just some regular DDR5 RAM into here and have it work? Yes, absolutely. And as long as the model was going to be fitting inside the VRAM of the GPUs, it wouldn't present a problem at all. That probably is a pretty decent way to go. Let me introduce you to another concept that's come about that I think is evolving in my mind a lot more to make a lot more sense, given that I have quad 3090s and a lot of people have been asking questions around, well, what about lower cards and mixing lower cards in? Having a lead card is a really good idea. The reason that having a lead GPU is a good idea is because if you wanna do image generation, video generation, a the best GPU you can get is going to be the best experience you can get. Literally, if you can buy like an H100, that's gonna be a really great experience for you. But most people aren't gonna be able to do that. So a 5090, a 4090, a 3090, those are gonna be in that pecking order, the best video and image generation GPUs you can get. Your 3090s are in the $750 price range though. So that is a really great option. It is definitely going to be only about half the speed for video and image generation of a 4090 though. So if that's something you're gonna do intense amounts of, you definitely wanna factor that in. If you want to have a complete VFX pipeline where you're running and generating four videos at a time, you definitely need to have something that is going to have full bandwidth like a server or workstation motherboard like an AMD Epic or a Threadripper Pro. The reason why is because if you are doing image generation on one GPU, it will definitely cap out all of the available PCIe bandwidth while it's operating. So definitely factor that in if you want to have multiple GPUs running in one rig and doing video generation or image generation, especially long running tasks, you would definitely want to have a server or workstation motherboard. So you would be able to get a faster core speed like the Ryzen 5 kind of consumer lineup in a Threadripper Pro, and the 5955WX is still a pretty good option in that on a WRX80. I've got one of those. It is still a really good CPU. Going with consumer RAM saves you a lot of headache also because it's super available. Whereas ECC, you're almost always gonna be ordering it from eBay. I've got links to all this stuff in the description below, so be sure to check that out. So these are some of the considerations I would make that are different around specifically the motherboard. Now, on this entire rig, there's a couple other things I would change. So I would actually probably get bigger fans to run across the front that run at a little higher speed. These Silent X fans that I had are kind of ancient. They really are silent. I mean, this entire thing I'm setting right beside it is totally not annoying. So that is something if you are considering noise as a primary factor, you might go with those Silent X fans or some other comparable incredibly silent fan. Maybe some of those ugly Noctunas could be bolted in here. You probably could make that happen. Does add a lot of cost, but definitely you don't have to have a giant CPU water cooler. That is something that I did because I wanted to control the noise a lot and it did work, but definitely something like the Peerless Assassin a much cheaper and much easier option to adapt. So I think we've covered the frame. We've covered the motherboard, RAM. So when you're looking at RAM, really you should kind of target, how to say this? Do you, run, do you wanna run the big boys? That's question one. When I say like big boys, I'm talking, do you wanna run the 600 parameter models? That is a different, classification of system that you need. Like frankly, that is a crazy big system that you need and that is a lot of RAM. 
and to get that in VRAM is going to be pretty cost pro prohibitive for almost everybody. To get that in system RAM is not at all that cost prohibitive, but you are going to be limited in your performance. So if you have a hard performance target of four tokens per second, yes, DDR4, even at 2400 speed, on larger models at Q4 can happen. If you have a 10 or so token per second goal, then you would need to step up to a completely different generation and your costs balloon quite a bit. If you run dual channel, on your AMD consumer grade motherboard, it's going to work really good. You can definitely install Proxmox. You can definitely do all of that. You can save money, quite a bit of money by going this route also because that motherboard's like $125 and this CPU is really cheap. They've got some cheaper ones. I would seriously recommend only the 9600X though and not going with one of the lower ones because you do start to see that the number of cores that you have, if you are doing certain things, you're gonna wanna have more cores and six is already not that many. Eight might be a little bit better if you were budgeting for it though. I think the 9600X, probably the best bang for the buck, and that is for a dedicated AI server that you would have. Now, of course, we've talked about the power like consumption of the GPUs kind of at a surface level. Let me show you something that conceptually a lot of people have asked about, and I've explained it in the comments, but I've never explained it in depth in a video, I don't think. So you'll note here, and a lot of people are like, how are your 3090s idling at like 11 to 15? 13 watts. The reason why they're idling so much better is because I have a PL in place on the GPUs. So you see the 225 watts over there on the side. If you've followed along with my guides, which you should be following along with my guides that show you everything on how to get set up with everything. One of the steps when you're setting up your core system is setting a cron tab that will set the power limit and cap it at blank. You can define the blank, but if you're looking at 3090s, this is a 350 watt GPU per GPU. And your idle will be substantially higher if you just let it be at a uncapped. As soon as you cap that down, I've got mine capped here at 200, 225, the idle draw of the GPUs goes down substantially. Now, does that impact my performance? So it can impact performance in certain scenarios for inference, but not most scenarios where I'm using the largest model possible and spreading it across the GPUs. The reason why is because those GPUs are never gonna hit 225 watts. Even if I had it uncapped, they're going to actually be lower than that. The reason why, it's only gonna use about a quarter of the processing capacity on this. So definitely factor in, if you're using inference, you can apply a generous power cap to high-end GPUs for inference purposes. Now, if you start doing image generation or video generation, of course you wanna take that back because every watt translates to just a little bit more performance. But if you're looking at you know, image generation and video generation, those are different use cases. So you need to define your use cases upfront before you make a hardware purchase, ideally if you are looking at what is the best bang for the buck. I think this actually is probably a really good option that I think I'm gonna put together to show you guys what it looks like, how it performs, and all the you know intricacies of it, but definitely the B650 Eagle, a cheapo motherboard, a cheapo processor, and well, RAM is just you know kind of the price of RAM. Conceptually, having lead GPU and follower GPUs is a really good concept also. And the reason why it works out for this motherboard and this you know, 4090 in particular is because this slot at the top is a 16X and that is Gen 4 speeds. So that will actually for image and video generation still allow me to run one instance of image and video generation off of this without any performance implications. But the other cool thing is that it doesn't have to always stay there. It'll automatically change and down clock. So if you see here, people always comment, they're like, it says Gen 1 at 16 on this over here. Yes, and of course it says that. Until you start using it, that's kind of how it saves electricity. When it's electrically connected at 16 and utilizing all 16, it's going to eat more watts of power. So it is automatically gonna down clock to whatever its base one Gen 1 at 16 is or whatever its width is. So for these, it's at 16. So quad GPU rig, 
probably could save, in my estimation, easily $1,250 off the price by going with these components instead of these components. Did you hear that? Probably $1,250 off of a quad 3090 rig. So I'll put together a spreadsheet, links to all this stuff in the description below. But those are some of the primary things that I think are important. There are a couple other things I would say from a overview that is geared towards normal people, uh, geared towards normal people's usage patterns. If you did uncap this and you were running all of these at 350 watts, there's not really a PSU out there that's gonna be able to handle that on an AMD Epic motherboard also at the same time. Those all are gonna come out to be like 1800 watts. So you would need a 2000 watt PSU. Now you can get those in the EU. Those are gonna be wired up to 220 VAC though. So you would have to have two different PSUs. Don't just grab two PSUs, put them on, plug them into the plugs next to each other. That right there is on the same circuit. So your circuit is your limiter there. And if you have a 20 amp US residential circuit, you will not be able to consistently pull that off of just one circuit. You should have dual circuits that go all the way back to your circuit panel. That's the safe way to do it. Of course, you uh, probably need to call an electrician. There's a lot that can go into that, so that's non-trivial. So definitely when you look at the considerations, how much electricity on different circuits at a location do you have? Call a Sparky, get them out, and have it done professionally. That way you also have the permits and stuff like that that you can show if you go to sell your house. So these are some of the things that I think are primarily, you know, the most important things. Let's recap it really quick. So the frame, love the frame, really recommend the frame. The frames are awesome also. They look cool, they work great, and they provide excellent functionality. The noise level is just super acceptable also. Setting beside this, I mean, this is quieter than any of my, my desktop PCs. Like, I mean, that is quieter than any of my desktop PCs. I do like it a lot. Having a water cooler instead of an air cooler, probably not needed. And the Peerless Assassin, cheap compared to the water cooler, much cheaper compared to the water cooler. Getting the adapter kit for an Epic or a Threadripper is also a little bit of a pain. So going with a consumer CPU is gonna be a very wide variety of air coolers that you would be able to use or water coolers. So you could factor that in as an ease and convenience kind of thing also, because you usually have to order special brackets. Going with just consumer RAM, something in the 32 minimum Probably 64 is where you should really be at, 64 gigabytes. That way, if you are needing to offload and onload into your VRAM and have a little bit of spillover, it's not that bad. Your system bandwidth, of course, on this is going to be limited to, I believe it's about 80 gigabytes per second. Maybe some of the newer ones are a little bit higher than that. That's the actual bandwidth you'll be able to hit. There's a little bit higher theoretical. Nothing ever works out quite like that though. The GPUs, like if you're looking at your 3090s, you're at 930 gigabytes a second. So that's a huge step down from a 3090 to that. So if you're planning on running and spilling into system RAM the entire time, understand there's going to be performance hit that comes along with that. When you're looking at something like a 5060 Ti, you're at about 425 gigabytes per second, real world. It's a little bit higher than that theoretical. And if you're looking at a 4090, you're at right about one terabyte a second comes in about 950 gigabytes a second in the real world. Definitely think though, this is a better option for most people out there that are setting this up if you don't want to run the big models. And I think a lot of people out there really don't want to run the big models because the tokens per second are not high enough. Really where you're gonna find the great performance for local is having everything run really fast and in pure VRAM. So if that's GPT OSS, which is a great model, a lot of people like that, the 120B quad 24 gigabyte GPUs does work out. That is an inference monster. To be honest with you, that's quite an inference monster. So yeah, I think that is a lot of information for you. I am sure you're gonna have a lot of very specific questions. Ask those in the comments below. Be sure to hit like and also subscribe if you haven't and ring the bell so you get notified when we do more cool content. Again, big shout out to all of our channel members. My hat's off to you. Thanks, have a great day. Check you out next time.